Well, it's great to be back with all of you. As the introduction said, I've, I was here five years ago. Um, and interestingly enough, for those of you who don't remember, five years ago kind of looked a little bleak. And the whole theme of my talk was how you know, things had looked bleak basically in every decade of my life. I've been around a long time, and yet things seem to always work out. And so that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, this just shows my first slide five years ago. Some of you will remember the images here, but they might remind, and hopefully they'll remind you of some of the issues we were facing. But uh, this is what it looks like today. And today, you know, maybe it's even a little darker. Um, and it's easy to be gloomy about what we see in the newspapers every day. And it's also, I think, um, it's easy to be gloomy when you think about the macro environment that we're facing. I don't need to tell you guys this, but you know, the NASDAQ index has collapsed, inflation has gone crazy, um, mortgages in the US and probably here have doubled uh, in just one year. So all that sounds pretty bad. Uh, and it's worth noting as well that um, in addition to the, what's happening in the macro environment, what happens in the macro environment dramatically impacts what happens in the venture capital ecosystem. Here you can just see over the last 15 years, uh, the NASDAQ um, goes up and venture capital funding goes up and venture dollars get invested. These things are incredibly highly correlated. And of course, this is what's happened to the NASDAQ in the last nine months or 10 months. And so, you know, it will not surprise any of you that liquidity is contracting in the ecosystem. Um, you know, valuations are coming down and all of that is incredibly scary. Um, so I could give you a talk about doom and gloom. I've lived through a few cycles. Bad things do happen in, uh, in these downturns, but that's not really what I'm here to talk about. Um, I think what's important to understand is that we are in the middle of a financial cycle. And yes, there are also other macro factors, um, but this is actually a necessary part of the ecosystem. And what happens on the far end of it is actually really good. So, you, you know, it's, it's, it's not something you need to have uh, described in great detail. You know, lots of, you know, the, the thing, good things happen in the stock market. Venture capital dollars accumulate and they get pumped into startups. There aren't actually enough startups to take all of that money. So valuations go way up. Founders with a lot of money now have to figure out how to compete with each other. They try to grow as fast as possible, uh, generally pretty inefficiently. Uh, and then in the times we're seeing now, you know, things come down to earth. Money is much harder to find. Um, and the great news is that good things start happening on the back end. You know, scarcity of capital is actually really good for financial discipline. I don't know if any of you were with me. I'll talk about Cloudflare in a few minutes, but you know, I, was, I did a fireside with Matthew Prince, the, one of the founders of Cloudflare, and he talked about how much uh, that company's sort of DNA uh, was crafted by the fact that they were started in 2009 and raised money in 2010 and 2012, and it was, it was actually pretty hard to do. Uh, and so I think the, the other end of this cycle is something to look forward to. You know, the, the companies that are born in this era will be, will be different. And they will be, uh, in many cases, turn out to be great companies. I just have a slide here, if I can get this to work, um, which shows you some of the companies that were funded during the Great Recession. Uh, that's the next slide. Here you go. Some of these are NEA companies. Some of them are not. But all of these companies were funded during the Great Recession, and look how they turned out. Uh, the message for all of you is that great companies are born and funded in this environment. Uh, and as an example, at NEA, we never close the doors. You know, we are still funding companies week in and week out. Uh, not so much because valuations are down. Yes, valuations are, are down from what they used to be, but because the kind of companies and the kind of entrepreneurs that come out in this sort of environment and, this, and the sort of discipline that they develop is what leads to great things. Um, what I want to focus on is what we are most excited about NEA, which is funding companies that are mission-driven. And this is also relevant in this time, because companies that are mission-driven end up having uh, also special DNA. And it's the kind of DNA that allows them to weather the storm. So, as I said, I'm going to come to Cloudflare. For those of you who aren't familiar, this is one of the largest internet uh, properties today. The network is, I think, one of the three largest in the world, 
only rivaled by Google and uh, Facebook. Uh, and Cloudflare today um, protects tens of millions of websites. Uh, it uh, protects them from 70 billion attacks a day uh, and serves um, you know, thousands and thousands. I don't have the numbers on all the best companies that, that use Cloudflare, but Cloudflare protects a huge part of the internet. What is their mission? Their mission is to build a better internet. And when I asked Matthew a few minutes ago about hiring and why Cloudflare was able to hire so many great people, he pointed to the mission. You know, people get excited about what they're doing, and that has stood the test of time for Cloudflare and many other companies that I'm going to talk about. You can not only hire great people because of the mission, but those people tend to stick around because they aren't in it just for the money. They're in it for the mission, and so they're, they're, they're generally more patient. Um, another company that I want to mention is Goodleap. You know, we're, a mission that we're really excited about is, is trying to bend the curve on climate change, and this company is doing it already at scale. For those of you who are outside the United States, you wouldn't probably recognize the name, but, but this company finances 28% of residential uh, solar systems deployed in the United States today. They fund a billion dollars a month of solar loans. And that's just a starting point. They, they fund you know, other, other basically energy-saving home improvements, uh, and they're doing it at scale. Um, the founders of this company, were, the, were some of the top executives of Solar City, again, a US-centric company, uh, but at one point had 40% of the, the loan volume for solar loans in the United States. So they knew exactly what they were doing when they founded this company in 2016. They examined the whole value chain. They took advantage of the technology which is available uh, and enables them to deliver these loans through um, essentially installers and and independent sales organizations in a way that um, is, is really accretive to everybody in the system. Salespeople are more effective, easier for consumers to understand, and ultimately, it's an incredible value proposition. Most homeowners save about 25% of their electric bill. So they've already saved something like $6 billion for homeowners, 160,000 of them, and, um, and they're offsetting uh, you know, tons of of CO2 emissions as well, 31 billion metric tons of CO2 emissions. Another company a little closer at home, hopefully, hopefully you've heard of this one, Konix, this is a European company based in Munich, uh, is, is also a mission-driven company. It wouldn't necessarily appear like a mission-driven company if you just think about what they do, which is they make, uh, they make technology to make railways more efficient. That doesn't sound terribly mission-driven, but trust me, it is. Uh, and, and the savings that they generate, about 25% uh, for, uh, for Deutsche Bahn and, and other large railways, uh, enable the, these companies to be more efficient, to be more reliable, to save on downtime. And of course, the market for this is enormous. I think the cost of downtime worldwide is 200 and something billion a year. So we're really excited about the mission of this company. Um, another one uh, close to home here is Aquabyte. Uh, I didn't realize it until I was preparing my remarks, but uh, the last time I was here, five years ago, Aquabyte was developing their system in a bathtub in Norway. Uh, and what they do is they use artificial intelligence and machine learning to look at fish, fish in fish farms. Uh, as we all know, fish farms can be, you know, sort of not the cleanest way to generate protein on the planet, but done well, they're a relatively important and, and uh, efficient, clean way uh, to develop an important protein source. So they look at fish and they're able to detect disease and other things that makes fish farms safer and more efficient. Uh, the company today is all over the world in just five years, very exciting. Lastly, I want to talk about Coursera. Um, another, you know, obvious mission-driven company for us. This company was founded by two Stanford professors, Andrew Ng and Daphne, um, Daphne Kohler, and they, they realized that not everybody could afford Stanford. Forget the difficulty of getting in. Uh, all of these great institutions were sort of, you know, walled off from most of the people in the world, and they wanted to open up their classrooms. So, in 2012, they decided to put two uh, of their uh, graduate level computer science classes online and open them up through what is today called a MOOC, massively open, uh, open something course. Anyway, 
they tweeted about it, and amazingly, within two weeks, they had 100,000 students sign up for each class. You want to talk about product market fit. One tweet, 200,000 people sign up. And let's not forget, these are graduate level computer science classes at Stanford. Not everybody thinks they're going to go take those classes. But they had 200,000 of them uh, overnight. And um, actually, Daphne came over to my house for lunch, and I said, wow, this is a business. And she said, no, this isn't a business. This is a nonprofit. And I said, nonprofit? No, no, if you want to develop great software, which is what you have to do to make this company succeed, it needs to be a business. And so that was the premise of Coursera. But Daphne got me to promise that we would always have free offerings for the courses. And today, uh, what is it, 10 years later, Coursera has saved people who otherwise would have had to pay uh, for their offerings a half a billion dollars. So, uh, and they have 100 million learners, uh, 175 uh, top universities from around the world, great corporate partners like Facebook and Google. It's really an exciting company. And effectively, they're delivering high quality education to anybody, anywhere. I don't know how much time I have, five minutes. So we'll try to, to, try to summarize the idea of a mission-driven company is that, as I said, you can attract people that you couldn't otherwise attract, because they're not here just for the money. They're here for the mission. And that actually delivers, ultimately, better execution. Uh, with better execution, you can have better impact. And with better impact, you affirm what you set out to do in the first place, which is you know, create uh, some sort of impact through your mission. So the thing I want to leave you with is that you have that same opportunity. All of you, I hope, are doing something that you find really impactful, because we need you to be doing something impactful. The world has plenty of problems to solve, uh, and I believe they're mostly solved through entrepreneurship and, and startup companies. So I hope you're doing something great. We'd love to hear about it. We'd love to hear about your mission and the company you want to build. Thank you very much.